Good evening and welcome to A Slice of Life. I'm your host, Jim Therian. My guest tonight is Donna Merrill. Donna Merrill's in charge of something called Pollinator Pathways, and she's here tonight to tell us what that's all about. Donna Merrill, welcome to A Slice of Life. It is so nice to be here, and I can't wait to talk to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, tell us, what is a pollinator pathway? Well, it's, it's a complicated question that I can make very simple. What we're doing right here is the pollinator pathway. It's all about a conversation, reaching out to the community, getting people to think about their backyards, think about what they can do to help wildlife, and um, collaborate and connect and grow together as individuals and as communities to, to turn around the kind of mess that we've gotten ourselves in with our environment. What, what would you say is the core value of, of, of a pollinator par, uh, garden? Well, a lot of the core value is really, maybe I should back up and talk about what gave rise to the pollinator pathway because it doesn't, didn't really have anything to do to po with pollinators to begin with. It um, started from a desire to engage landowners. And I was working with a regional conservation partnership down in um, Fairfield and County, Connecticut, and Westchester County, New York. And we got a grant from the US Forest Service. Oh, wow. And they said, we need help. We know how to talk the to- The Forest th Service said we need Yeah, help? we need help. We know how to talk to people that have, you know, woodlots, and we know how to talk to foresters in the north of Maine, but we don't have a clue how to connect with people who live in the suburbs oh, wow. or in the cities. And, you know, thinking back to that, I think what they're looking at is, particularly in the state of Connecticut, um, right now our state is 65% forested wow. and 35% developed, but it's projected for those numbers to flip by 2060. Oh, wow. uh, we'll have 65% of the state will be urban and suburban development. Wow. And with that in mind, they've got to begin to, you know, uh, handle the environment there. So, so um, I had to come up with some idea to connect with landowners to be able to get them to talk. And I happened to see a little article in a paper uh, about a woman in Oslo, Norway, who created um, a bee highway to protect the pollinators in right. Oslo. And I thought, well, why don't I do at that time, I called it a bee highway, but it was really just a, a way to get pollinators to move through the environment. Wow. So I spent, I, I took some money from the grant, I bought a hundred plus trees, and I spent the better part of a year driving around with these trees hanging out of the back of my SUV <laughs> and talking to people right. and saying, would you like a free tree? These were all native trees right. that would host caterpillars and um, you know, native bees. So it, it worked and it was electrifying and the grant ended and next thing I knew I was sitting back in my kitchen and I thought, wow, what just happened? Right, right. So that was, it, it really came from something that had nothing to do with pollinators. So you're not only the director, you are in fact the creator. Yeah, I, I started the whole shebang. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it had been done out in Seattle in the early 2000s. A woman right. had done a kind of a median strip between two parks with pollinators. Right. And then this instance in Oslo, Norway. I mean, you know, I had some seeds to my thinking. But um, yeah, so what I did was I, I just decided this can't stop. Right. This is just too good. So um, setting up the model of what we ask other towns to do, I went out and I got the head of our nature center, the chair of our conservation commission in the town where I live, Wilton, uh, the chair of the inland wetlands, the head of the watershed, the leader of the conservation partnership, and right. me, I was, and I sat them down around a table and I pitched them and they bit. They said, <laughs> okay, let's do it. Excellent. So that Excellent. was how it all started. And that was in um, 2017. And 
it was simultaneous with a lot of bad news that was coming out about insects. Oh. Some, some science had come out of Germany saying that, you know, the insect populations are collapsing. Right. Monarch populations were down 96%, you know, yeah. here yeah. in this country. And um, also right in that, I think it was in that spring of 2017, the New York Times Magazine had come out with a big article called the insect apocalypse. Could you, could you zero in on the benefits of a uh, native plant garden or a pollinator pathway? Yeah, sure. Well, the thing about um, native plants is the number one threat to the collapse of our insects is habitat loss. Oh. And native trees, or any tree, is um, the way our environment takes sunlight and, and changes it into a form that can support life. Right. So um, there's basically two things going on with native plants. You've got um, the insects that evolved with these plants in any one section that, you know, uh, they, they share an evolutionary history and plants, they have to reproduce and they use insects primarily for right. reproduction and that's what pollination is. And then at the same time, you've got things that eat the leaves of the trees and right. shrubs. And those are primarily our caterpillars which form the bottom of the food chain. And that takes the sun's energy and moves it up the food web so, you know, to support not just the caterpillars but the birds and the amphibians and the mammals and eventually us. Right, right. So it's, um, it's native plants, without native plants, I mean a good way to think about it is we are all familiar with say monarch butterflies. If, right. you, if, if they're specialized because they share a history. So you have a monarch butterfly, the way to get them is milkweed. And if you were to pull all the milkweed out of your garden and put in hostas, right. which are native to China, and think you're going to see a monarch, it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Not going to happen. So native plants are really key to, to keeping our insects and our bumblebees and our native bees and our butterflies um, and, alive. And there's a big, a big diversity of pollinators. It's not just the honeybee and the bumblebee and well, there's yeah, all kinds there's, of pollinators. There's a lot of misinformation and, and honeybees, as a matter of fact, are non-native. Right. And so, you know, I, I get that it's a hobby and there's, we need honey and, you know, they're, they're kind of livestock for agriculture. They're important. But um, I think in Connecticut, gee, I, I don't remember, there's like something like 350 species of native bees. Wow. And um, they all need to gather nectar and pollen. So. Um, there is a lot of diversity, and of course, all our butterflies that come out. It's, it's now, uh, how big does a pollinator pathway or garden have to be? Well, the fun thing about the pollinator pathway is it's scalable. You can it, it's it's it can be a, I like to say a six-inch pot that you put on your windowsill, and you plant it with a native plant, and you're on the pollinator pathway. Oh. so you can have you know, a, a little container garden, you can do your whole backyard, or you can have a large restoration project, which would be done by a land trust, say, um, all just restoring native plants. And, and that makes it easy for all different types of people to do it. Older people can do it, little children can do it, people that are infirm can, you know, put out a pot and be right. able to see a butterfly come, so it's, it's good for all ages. Now, when did this all get started? So, in 2017. Oh. And we um, took all of this, we kind of popped up at the right time um, with all this negative news that came out. Right. And here we are giving out a positive message. You know, we're, we, we're, we're saying, you know, we've kind of painted ourselves into a corner with the houses we built we've cut down all the trees and we've, uh, you know, our, our ecosystems are suffering, but we can turn it around right. by individual action. And I think... Right in your own backyard? Right in your own backyard. And I think it's that positive message that made the difference. Right. Instead of being paralyzed by all of the doom and gloom, 
and you know that the drumbeats of doom and gloom nobody knows what to do it's like oh my gosh it's you know I, I think as an individual it would seem insurmountable you know what can I it do? would yeah but not with a pollinator pathway you put a tree outside your kitchen window and it blooms and the bumblebees show up and right. um, it doesn't take any more than that now about about how many pollinator pathways do you have are, are out there? Well, the, the pollinator pathway really is formed at the municipal level. You know, that's kind of our model. Right. And if you go onto our website, uh, we'll, we'll have kind of a starter kit, how to oh. get it going. And, um, you know, with the steps to get it started in your town. Right, right now, officially on the pollinator pathway, I kind of lost count at about 300 towns. Um, pretty much from the elbow of Cape Cod up to northern Vermont, from Maine down to oh, wow. Maryland. Uh, we're starting to see pollinator pathway towns pop up in the Midwest. And we're solidly in the state of Washington and Oregon wow. and South Carolina. So it, it's just... It's starting to grow. It's really starting to grow. Very, Excellent. very exciting. Yeah, Excellent. it's really exciting. Um, so, how long have you been with Pollinator Pathway since well, 2017? Yeah, I st we started it in 2017. Wow. That's so, very impressive, Don. Yeah, it really, it, it, and in a way, it took on a life of its own. It's like we we put it out there and just let it happen, and right. it, it, it just nothing that we did. Do you we, think that's basically because people are concerned? They have a concern. I do. I I I think people that um, you know they they watch what's going on outside. Yeah. And I know I've lived in my house for th over 35 years, and the forest just isn't the way it used to be. No. I don't see the animals. The the you know the understory is gone. Um, so it. There is an awareness that things aren't the same, and this is completely different than climate change. Climate change, oh yes, you know, the loss of biodiversity is actually, um, uh, if, if there were no climate change, we would still be in dire straits just because of the loss of biodiversity. Okay, so we're going to go to break now. Okay. Uh, the break consists of people planting their own. Uh, pollinator pathway. Yeah. When, when we come really back from break, we'll talk about that. Yeah, it's really exciting. All right, thank you, Donna. Mm -hmm. We're helping plant a pollinator garden in Richfield for the pollinator pathway. What's going on today is that throughout Ridgefield we're installing a connected set of pollinator gardens to promote the education of our community about pollinators and the importance of insects in general. The Ridgefield Pollinator Pathway and neighboring towns pollinator pathway is such a great example of community engagement around pollinators. Connect connecting habitat patches in a concerted way is I think one of the best ways to think about pollinators on the scale that they are using the landscape. So bumblebees are traveling something like three miles to get different resources for their nest. They're trying to get the perfect balance of protein to lipid content. Sometimes that means they're going up and down and up and down looking for the right plants to balance that content for their offspring. So the more pollinator resources you have in a connected way is great for pollinators creating a messy lawn, but you want to advertise to others that this is something you're doing deliberately, <laughs> is to put up a habitat sign. Yeah, um, well, we got some volunteers here to plant our first pollinator pilot garden, and we pulled out the mugwort, and now we are planting. And We've got our pretty darn quick seed mix from Prairie Moon with the wetland enhancement. Well, there's a wide variety of items, and uh, we have purple cone flower there, cardinal flower, we have different clovers, right? Clovers, we have uh, golden rods. I went to a talk that said, 
the perfect way to start a pollinator garden is uh, three, three, three. You do three plants that bloom in the spring early for like the first pollinators that need nectar. Then you do three that are over the summer and you do three that are fall. And then you can add and should add some host plants like the milkweed that the caterpillars use. Tomorrow morning I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna become part of the pollinator pathway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we're back. So Donna, I have a question for you now. Let's say somebody is at home and they, they are getting really excited about a, a pollinator pathway in their neighborhood or in their town. What, what steps do they take to, to get that, to make that happen? Well, like I said in the beginning, a lot of this is about just starting a conversation. Right. And if I were excited about a pollinator pathway, um, I can do it in isolation in my own backyard, but I think it's really important to build community around this. Yeah. And yeah. for example, uh, a good idea would be to go to the land trust in your town and oh. say, you know, I want to do this, do you want to help? And, and then begin to bring in the conservation groups and people that are naturally in working in conser conservation um, to get involved. And now, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go nope. ahead. Those people in the video that were planting, yeah. what was that space before they decided to put the pollinator pathway in? Well, that was actually a public space along a trail oh. that is being built from Norwalk to Danbury called the Norwalk River Valley Trail. Oh. And this, this was a, a totally degraded spot full of invasive species that was a, basically, I think, a, a place where stuff had been dumped. Yeah. And we cleared it out. And it's, it's a really good spot because it's going to be on public view. Right. And so, um, and you see how much fun it is. Yeah, they it's, were having a good time. You, you get together, and um, it's pretty easy to get some uh, <coughs> small grants to buy plants. Positive and energy is very contagious. It, it's really, really um, affordable, and it's fun, and it's like an adventure. Yeah. Because once it's done, you can go back and just see where there was no life. Right. Maybe it was just a staging ground for you know gravel. Right. And boom, you've got butterflies and native bees all and all of sorts of stuff, and then everything else that feeds with them. It's, it's very exciting. Now, as director, creator, and director, <laughs> would, would you say that you are a busy woman? Well, I mean, I am busy particularly now because we were just an informal group yeah. until about six months ago. Oh. And uh, we became a nonprofit. Oh, and so my, all of those people you saw in that were, you know, part of my steering committee, or the, not my steering committee, the steering committee, and just yep. informal. Yeah. But now they've all agreed to step up and formalize as a board, and so there's more operational stuff going on. Yep. But what it has happened is I've been able to go out and um, raise a little bit of money, and we're going to have our first staff person starting September 5th just to start to grow this. And so that's a when big you started in 2017, did you think you would get to this point? No, no. I, I, it was going to be just purely in Wilton. Yeah. But the minute we got going in Wilton, the <coughs> town to the north of us, Ridgefield, which you saw on the, yes. they said, we want to do this. Yeah. And then Norwalk, and then next thing you know, this pathway was going in all directions, Darien, um, and then towards New Haven. I, I think it, it just, people are I getting stop very it. concerned yeah, about I, the amount of poison out there. Oh, well, then that's another and thing. And how it's indiscriminately yeah. used, you know, it we, seems. We ask people to do three things, people that want to be on the pollinator pathway. Very simple, plant natives, mm -hmm. which we've talked about. Rethink your lawn, which we haven't talked about yet, but we might, and avoid pesticides. Right. And. Um, you know, that the, the pesticides are a, a big, huge problem because they get in, into our water supply. Right. And um, pollute our streams and rivers and Long right. Island Sound. And I think that's especially true here at the, um, at the shoreline, where the water table, prob and I don't know this for a fact, I'm yeah. guessing, but the water table is probably four or five feet down at the most. 
Yeah. And, you know, you put poisons in your yard, I have yeah. to assume a big heavy rain will wash it into the water table and then eventually into Long Island Sound. That's exactly what happens. Yeah. And when pesticides are applied to a lawn, for example, or an agricultural crop, but to a lawn, only a very small percentage is actually taken up by the plants. Right. So you apply a very dangerous one for um, pollinators is something called neonicotinoids. You apply them, 5% is taken up by the plants, 1% is you know released into the air, 94% either is taken by surface runoff or goes into the ground. Wow. So that's a lot of poison we're adding into, right. our, into our water supply. And not only the bugs, but it also kills the uh, microscopic flora and fauna of the soil, I yeah. imagine, as yep. well. Yep, yep. I mean, fungicides are uh, particularly dangerous. Uh, yeah. They're heavily used on golf courses, and I'm nothing against the game of golf, but yeah, you, you know, know you've got to be careful. You know, you don't want to piss anybody off. No, but you wanna, no, no. You no. want to deliver. You have to deliver the message. So that's very positive. And I, we don't really have the answers in a lot of pla places yet. You know? Right. So it's um, it's an ongoing process. But in people's backyards, they don't have to use these pesticides. Right. So that's a good place to start. Now, I'd like to talk about your website. In preparing yeah. for this show, I've gone to the website several times, and it is just a wealth of information and contacts and sources of uh, information about plants and all that other stuff that you can, that you can actually use to create your own poll pollinator pathway. So we have this starter kit. But then once you decide in a town that you want to get on the pollinator pathway, Everything we do is open source. We charge for nothing. Yeah. All the brochures, we've already done all the graphics. You just print them and give them out at your, uh, whatever your event is. Right. Plant lists. Um, and then we have a lot of fun tools, which are, for example, the map with all, where you can put your property on the right. pollinator pathway. And you can zoom in and see, you know, who and, nearby you and is And that is it. actually an astounding map to think how many yeah. gardens are out yeah. there. Yeah, we've had, um, I, I don't know how many are on there, but that, the last I looked, which was months ago, we've had something like 70,000 hits on that map. I yeah. mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. And then the other good thing is our sign, which you can get on, on our website. And that, you put that up and it, it kind of broadcasts that what I'm doing is intentional. Right. I'm on the pollinator pathway. Maybe my lawn isn't as neat as your lawn, right, but right. I'm doing that on purpose. And, <coughs> and Excuse it's, me. Um, I, I think it's nice that you have a list of the trees and shrubs yep. and a least list of the perennials. Yep. Um, because people, you know, you don't you don't really know where to start if you don't if you're just new to the the concept of pollinator pathways. Yeah, I and mean, we, we've actually are just on the verge of, of uh, putting up a new list. Oh. Easier to read, Yeah. Um, trees and shrubs, but everything is broken down into, you know, wet or dry, yep. shade, yep. part shade, sun. Um, we're, we've been working on it for months, and I think it's going to go up on our website in the next week I, or two. I also think it's very nice that you, um, uh, that you have the uh, scientific name there. Yes. I was told by a professional gardener that uh, using the scientific name is not snooty, it's just uh, descriptive and accurate. Well, when you go to a nursery and say you want, you know, like a, uh, what's a common name, bone set, there's, there's a bunch of different kinds of bone sets. Right. You know, hyssop leaf bone set or common bone set. If you give the nursery the botanical name, you're going to get exactly, exactly what, what you're looking, what you're for, looking right. for and what you expect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, otherwise, they don't know which plant to give you. So uh, do you have projects in the works? Or, or is every new call a new project? Uh, yeah, the, the thing about us at the kind of organization level is we let everybody just do whatever their community wants to do. Oh, okay. You know, so we sit back and watch the, it, it's so creative. I mean, some towns become on, come on the pollinator pathway and the first thing they do is go to the businesses and say, let's line Main Street with, you know, containers. Right. Some go to the Department of Transportation and next thing you know, all of the, the roadsides are covered with pollinator pathways. Right. Some hold plant sales, you know, whatever, 
whatever a town wants to do, they can do. They right. can do it in their own way. So it's, it's fun to hear the stories and hear what, what's happening. And um, um, I, would, I would suggest to anybody in the audience that is interested in uh, Pollinator Pathway to go ahead and check out the website. Yep. It is a, it is a plethora of information uh, and things you wouldn't even think of. And it's nice that they have all these uh, native plants that are described, well, like you said, with uh, sun tolerant, shade tolerant, uh, wet feet, dry feet, all that stuff. It's, it's just wonderful. Oh, thank you. And I, I just am so delighted that you came tonight. Oh, I'm and delighted I would, to be I here. And I would like to close by saying, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's shameful that you haven't been interviewed by uh, network media or anything. <laughs> when you see all those uh, signs with, on the maps, yeah, it's well, just astounding to me that you're not being interviewed. We had a little clip done by CBS. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was back in the spring. And right, right, that right. That was great. But, uh, you know, going back to the website, I don't know how much time we have left here, but it's all about a conversation and learning from each other. Right. But then you can go to our website and take a deeper dive into the science. And, and that's why we have oh, all of yes. those resources on yeah, there. Yeah. Um, because I know I've been doing this for a while and I learn something new every day. So well, there's it's a lot never, of information never out there. ending. <laughs> all right, so that's it for tonight. Great. Donna, thank, thank you. you again. This has been great. Uh, the creator and uh, executive director of Pollinator Pathway. Uh, thank you for coming. And um, till next time, have a nice day. Thank you.